in Washington have been decimated with uh, smallpox. They lost about 90% of their population to smallpox. And this, this, what I'm telling you now about the natives is going to make sense to you when I close my talk. So that's why I'm telling you this. We were here in uh, Sinaik's territory, Okanagan. There were, uh, there were uh, native families living here up on the plateau where it was grasslands and big uh, ponderosa pine. It, wasn't, it was cedar behind me, but up where it's drier, up or towards Gilpin uh, grasslands, there were like giant ponderosa. There was a ponderosa every 1,500 feet. There was tall grass. Fire would come through here every 7 to 13 years because of the ecotype. And the water, the, the fish, until the, the different floods where the, the Columbia had, you know, like uh, before the, the uh, Columbia Gorge gave out, the water level, we would, we would have been under what is called the Missoula Glacial Lake. And the, the surface of that lake was 2,500 feet. The city of Grand Forks is at 1,700. So we would have been under 800 feet of water. So, we're, so these are things that are very important because it's our story. This is where we come from. These, our ancestors lived here. And we all come, we all come from a tribe somewhere. And uh, we need to remember this, you know, when we, we look at this place. And, and two, to remember that uh, when David Thompson came over, uh, he was well received by the natives. They helped him build his first house, set up his first establishment, and traded for food with him <laughs> all winter. And there was, there was a sense of, co of commune, and there's a sense of community sharing. Now, we're not here to talk about water tonight. We're here to talk about electromagnetic fields. But I'd like to acknowledge a few people who have brought this forth in the community. And if I could ask uh, Donna Semenoff, Julia Butler, uh, Bev and uh, Tom uh, Tripp to stand up. <laughs> These are the folks who brought this forth. And uh, my interest was that the electromagnetic is very important, but we need to bring the water in this. And again, it's something you'll understand. Um, I basically like to say, in terms of the city, there, there, there are serious water problems. You know, we talk of having a Class A aquifer, but, uh, and Donna may at some point later in the evening relate to us some of her questions around the uh, engineering report she's been looking at and the unanswered questions that are very important to this whole, this whole matter. Uh, we are getting, you know, we are getting the, the, they want to impose a machinery, but they've not answered all the questions. And I'm determined that they are going to answer the questions. And there's a story to all this. There's, there's a story in the background. And at some point or other, we're going to get the background story. I would hope it's sooner than later. But uh, I can tell you, there's going to be a concerted effort to get that story. Um, some of you were here when we fought the chlorine thing. You know, like this was another local uh, debate around water, and we lost that one. There's a question of when the, the river goes, really goes down, and the irrigators are really pumping a lot of water, that some of the folks who live on hillsides, their wells go dry. This has been an ongoing problem in Grand Forks. It's still there. That's not a city responsibility, of course, but those of us who live on the outskirts come up against a drying well, dry well. Some years are worse than others. And uh, we look at the river. You know, those of us who enjoy the river, 
are a bit appalled to see uh, how the river is going down. Uh, we're finding dead trout floating again this summer. And uh, we've got people who've got spr sprinklers on 24 hours a day. And their thing is, is that they've got water rights and it's use it or lose it. So they want to make sure that they don't leave any of their water in the ground. So those are questions. And there's the, 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 the famous Kettle River Management, Watershed Management Plan that was started last fall. And uh, I know myself and uh, my friend Barry Brando, who's not here tonight, unfortunately, are very interested in the final report because uh, both of us have been, uh, were not invited to the process, to the stakeholder process, and we're very concerned about uh, the uh, final report. And already we're reading in some of the, the uh, uh, workshop reports that uh, they, are, they are recommending that uh, smart meters, water metering, be a question. So on the water metering uh, question, there are water questions. And we, some of us have heard this before. Why did the city not go to public education before going directly to water meters? We're hearing from other towns like Creston. The, they, they went to a uh, public education, a community public education campaign with uh, water ambassadors, and they just, it's just a question of bringing people on board, because I don't know anybody who doesn't care about water in a dry part of, the dry, one of the driest parts of Canada. You know, like here in the Okanagan, there's nothing like it. It doesn't happen in Northern Ontario and Quebec. And so I want to talk to you a bit about the culture at City Hall over a 30-year period. I've been involved in water issues in this community since 1985. And that started with the uh, cyanide heat leaching operation that was set up on Burrell Creek. It went to a waste management hearing. It went to three environmental board hearings. We garnered 2,000 signatures on a petition opposing this plan presented at the Grand Forest City Council. Nada. They did want to do it, they did not want to support it. And then again, in 1993, this was the, 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 uh, the campaign for the Granby Park. Well, when I got involved in that, in the, nobody really knew where the Granby was. And what I saw in the Granby was the upper 50 kilometers of the Granby River were completely pristine. And you can still go in there and witness cedar trees like that size, untouched, no logging ever. The miners in the, the 18th or 19th century had torched it, like they torched all the forest around here to be able to look at bare rock. But it's come back, and it's there. And my main reason for doing this was to protect the headwaters of the river in support of the community. Again, presented a, a petition of 2,000 names to the city of Grand Forks, and it was again, nada. And every time there are questions that arise that I've experienced where people are presenting petitions, like last year, uh, Jan West, is it Jan West, who presented on the GMO? Westland. She presented a petition on uh, having Grand Forks as a GMO-free community. Amen. Nada. Again, 800 names this year on the, the, the water meters. Nada. And here we are. This is just a meeting that's called by one in individual tonight. Look how many people are here. If this, and this is what the city of Grand Forks should have done a year ago. They should have called town hall meetings. These information sessions where they have are set up in such a way that they can control the agenda. Nobody can talk like this publicly about their points of view on the matter. And so it kind of 
it kind of gives you, like me, it's sort of like, well, I'm not surprised that the Grand Fork City Council is not paying attention to those who come with petitions. They never have. But this time around, we're looking at something that's been going on for a number of years in third world countries. It's the commodification of water. Water has always been a God-given right if it was there. And God only knows how many people in the world don't have access to water. And now, it's, we're not getting, oh no, we're not trying to commodify water. But what happens, there are, the city is incurring costs in its water delivery programs. There are all kinds of leaks in the water mains. And so the question for me is being, well, why not just raise the taxes if you want to deal with the problem? But no, it's we want to meet, everybody should pay for what you use, right? And some governments agree with that. Like, we've, we're, we've got a government now, and like the, the, the local government does not want to negotiate with the petitioners, we've got a, a, a provincial government that doesn't want to negotiate with the teachers. It's kind of like you sandbag the issues, you hope they're going to go away, and in another sense, I mean, the, the, they would be just as happy that the, the Fraser Institute run our lives, and everything is privatized. We don't have medical insurance. We don't have anything. We pay as we go, and if you can't pay, you don't go. So it brings us down, and this is my point, and pay attention. This is where I'm coming. I've got a couple of minutes left. I'm coming back to what I was telling you about the natives who live here. Who owns the water? That's what I've been trying to find out. <laughs> yeah. But it's a really good question. Who owns the water? The Campion. I beg your pardon? The Campion. How can I say this is mine? It's flowing. It's continually moving. Yeah. So, and if you frame the question like this, who owns the water? On traditional land, uh, on the traditional lands of the Sinaiks and Okanagan nations, whose land claims have not been settled, that is a very, very interesting question. On the weekend, I asked the mayor. I said, "So, what kind of input did you get from the First Nations on?" your decision to install smart meters. Wow, this is a classic answer you get. Well, we'd really, we'd really like to have contact with them and work with them. But no, we didn't. So, this is where we're at, where I come from, is that city council is in breach of process on these grounds and should cease and desist with the installation of the smart meters yeah. Yeah. because there's already a law in the land that says if I am going to do as a government or as an individual I mean Interpol has to do it right they have to get their plan their logging plans reviewed by First Nations you know there is a process none of this has happened in Grand Forks and uh, I passed this on to the Tribal Council of British Columbia, and I'm hoping that uh, you know they're going to send me uh, a legal comment on this. But uh, for Mr. Mayor, who's going to be watching on Grand Forks TV, I would suggest right now, Mr. Mayor, that you get on it, use your mayor, mayor, mayor powers, put a hold on this, put a moratorium on this, until you've talked to the tribal council for the Okanagan Nation and to the Sinai's people, and maybe even to the Kootenai. I thank you very much for your time. And that's what I want to do. And now I would uh, like to uh, pass this on to uh, Dr. Uh, Ross Anderson.
Hi. Hello. So I got to turn on my equipment here. The other one. Off. These two front pegs oh, oh. off, please. And that one. The switch is right over there. No, oh, one's at the back and stay on. Okay. That one off. This one off. That's good. Thank you. Any more housekeeping? We all over know the washrooms are. Okay. Um, and. I better stay here on the microphone. Does that work? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there press here? I just want to make a couple of house cleaning comments. Um, uh, if there's press here, the press needs to make sure that they give unbiased, equal representation to all points of view. If that is not their intention, I would ask that they leave right now. Are we cool with that? Everything that I do is verbatim, so... I love it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, we've, we've had some challenges with some of the major networks uh, not, not reporting the, effectively the information I'm about to give. So, um, also, uh, for everyone here, some of you tonight will probably be upset with some of the things I have to say. Some of you may agree, some of you may not. Do not feel embarrassed if you want to get up and leave because you're totally upset with me, is what I tell you. Do not feel embarrassed if you need to get up and leave because you're in shock and you think you're going to faint or something like that. <laughs> uh, so uh, what we're talking about tonight is, is a little controversial and uh, there will be some shocking pictures and some other things and uh, it's, a, it's a very graphic presentation and a lot of information, so I'm going to move quite quickly. Your questions will likely be answered in the presentation. Hold your questions till the end. There will be questions and answers at the end. Write them down, put them, stow them away in your mind so that you can ask them, okay? But most of the time, things are answered as we go. So, um, the disclaimer is here because uh, I am a health professional, retired. I practiced as a naturopath and a chiropractor for 30 years in Ontario, and I'm not here to diagnose you or treat you, okay? And none of this information is for any of those purposes. And the other information up here is, is because you need to know that you have a right to arm yourself with knowledge, okay? It's very, very important that we do that because uh, whether or not you think it's true, your governments are not going to protect you. So. On we go. Keep an open mind. This is the way things work. Things go through three steps. First, the information is ridiculed. Then it is violently opposed. Then it is accepted as a matter of course. We are presently in number one and two with what I'm talking about tonight. We are being ridiculed and violently opposed. And some of the people here who've already been involved in this information are, are well aware of that. So, <clears throat> this is me, a chiropractor, naturopath, 1976 till 2006. I also have an osteopathic diploma. I went back to school in 2012 to keep my brain working properly. I began electromagnetic field evaluation in the late 1980s with patients. Um, I did. Uh, hundreds of evaluations of people's homes back then with archaic equipment uh, and other techniques that I had developed. And <clears throat> I will just tell you one quick story because it's quite interesting. The very first person that I uh, evaluated in this regard <clears throat> was an 11-year-old girl named Jennifer, who was quite ill, very ill. And I still get choked up about this. <clears throat> she was suffering chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and was not getting better, and that's not what happened in my clinic. It came to me, you got better. So, after about six weeks, I said to the mother, I said, we need to come and check out the house. So, off we went. <clears throat> well, Jennifer was sleeping in her bedroom, and her bed was up against the outside wall, and uh, a foot and a half from her head was where the electricity was coming into the house. And the electric and magnetic fields in her bedroom were off the charts. So, what did we 
we do? We moved her to another bedroom. Downstairs, where she did her homework, she was sitting four feet from where the electrical wires came down the side of the house to the basement. Same thing, she was sitting in a huge electromagnetic field. So what did we do? We got her to do her homework elsewhere. <clears throat> and voila, she got better. Literally, starting the next day. <clears throat> and I didn't have to do any more work on her. And oh, it was about two or three weeks, she was completely better. And um, it was quite miraculous. And I said to myself, hmm, this is very interesting. So that started <clears throat> my work. And I took a number of years off, and I'm back at it now. And as far as I know, I'm the only person in the whole area that's actually doing this work. So um, it's quite fascinating. I go into people's homes. I do evaluations on all of the aspects of their electromagnetic pollution. And I tell them what they need to do to clean up their environment. So that's what I do. Um, I was also the first patient in Canada to go, to go home <clears throat> the same day of low back surgery. Does anyone in here have low back surgery? <laughs> I went home the same day. It's not, not easy to do, and yes, I was in a lot of pain, but it was, it was fun to sit at my brother's <coughs> dinner table <laughs> that night. Uh, I did have throat cancer in 2005, and uh, I managed to beat that quite handily without medical treatment. I am supposed to be dead, but I am not, and I no longer have cancer. I'm not in remission. <laughs> I no longer have cancer. I had cataract surgery in my right eye at age 57. My father was 84. Why did I have cataracts at age 57? Does anyone have a guess? I used a cell phone a lot for a few years, like an idiot. And now I have a cataract in my left eye. Why did my right eye get it? Because I used the cell phone over here. I blew my ears out as a teenager with too much rock and roll. <laughs> It's a fact. <clears throat> Electromagnetic fields have always existed in nature. They are a direct current frequency between 0 and 100 cycles per second. The human body has adapted to these frequencies quite nicely. Our brain functions at 4 to 30 cycles per second. Our heart at 1 to 2 beats per second. Our pineal gland, which we need to produce the hormone that allows us to sleep, functions at about 10 cycles per second. These are all, all very gentle, slow frequencies that we have adapted to and we have been adapted to for as long as we've been here. And of course, that depends on how long you think we've been here. Our planet resonates at a frequency of about 7.83 cycles per second, at least it used to. That's actually gone up quite a bit as our planet is doing some very odd things these days. If you're studying this, you'll know that. But the frequencies at which some of these gadgets that we all, well, not all, some of us are using and addicted to, the frequencies are in ridiculous levels that our bodies are absolutely not adapted to. The electromagnetic spectrum, we could spend an hour on this, but we're not going to spend more than a minute because it's important that you look at this, and if you have the internet or you have a good library, I'm sure you've got a good library here, you can study the electromagnetic spectrum. The light that we see and the colors, red, orange, all those wonderful colors we see, are just a little tiny, tiny part in the visible area there of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it goes all the way from very low frequency fields, extremely low frequency fields, all the way up into the radiation that we use when we get our arm x-rayed when we have fallen and broken it, or the planet is being bombarded by all kinds of radiation, and that's why we have an ozone layer and an atmosphere that protect us from all of these extremely high frequency radiations. So the area that we're concerned about are the radio waves, uh, which we're going to be talking a lot about tonight, and which many people in this room utilize every day when they're texting and talking on their cell phones or using their cordless phones at home. You're using radio waves when you're doing that. And these are things that have made life very convenient for us, but maybe they aren't the best thing. So this is just another picture of the spectrum. Um, 
here, and we can see here microwave ovens. Does anyone know how a microwave oven works? It works on radio waves. I don't have one. They were illegal in the Soviet Union until 1988, until the Iron Curtain came down. Do you know why? Because they did a lot of research on them and found out that they were extremely dangerous. <coughs> so if you have one, I have news for you. They make a really good bread box. <laughs> Unplug it when you get home and never plug it in again. Um, if you ever want it tested, you'll see that your microwave oven emits radio waves that are actually quite damaging to the human body and they all leak. Every single one of them leaks. So, while we were sleeping, how did we get from almost no technological radiation just not, not many years ago, okay, to where we are now? How did we get all of this radiation happening to us on a constant basis. Are there cell towers here in Grand Forks? Yes. How many have you got? Two. You only have two cell towers? In the whole city? We have a mountain right downtown. That's pretty cool. Just the one downtown? You should count yourselves really, really lucky. Who knows how many cell towers there are in Toronto, Ontario? Does anyone know? 500. Higher. Tell us. Keep going. Thousand. Ten thousand. Oh. There are ten thousand cell towers in Toronto, Ontario. It gets scary. It gets way. It, it, it gets way worse. Uh, the Lower Mainland. Um, uh, you know, if you drive along Highway Number One into Vancouver, you just get bombarded. There, there are so many cell towers on along along the highway. There, it's it, it's it's a scary thing. Thing. So, how did we get here? John McCain did it. Remember him? Right? Did you know he had cancer on his face? On the left side, actually. He must be left-eared. Who's this? Cheryl Crow? Does anyone recognize her? Does anyone know who she is? I hope so. She wrote some great songs. Okay, brain tumor. She attributes it to her cell phone. This is an older picture. She does not use it anymore. <laughs> but it's not easy to find pictures of her with a cell phone, actually. So electropollution and electrosmog, okay, they are the same thing. You can call it either one. Okay? It is made up of many things. We're going to talk about that. Where is it? It is everywhere. You are sitting in it right now. It's emitting from the walls, from the electrical wires in this room. It's coming in here because if you turn a cell phone on, you have a signal. If you turn on a tablet, you can get probably get Wi-Fi. I don't know if there's Wi-Fi in here or not. I haven't actually turned my meter on to test. I usually do, but uh, I haven't actually done that yet. So we'll, we'll, find, we'll find out in a little while. So how is it created? We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about solutions, what to do about it. Radio frequency radiation, we've already talked a little bit about that. That's a big, big part of this. Magnetic fields are not as, as big a deal, but for some people they're horrific because their uh, environments in their bedrooms or in their homes or in their workplaces where they sit at work, they've got computers and all kinds of things around them. Magnetic fields can be horrifically damaging to certain people. Electrical fields and body voltage. What is body, what do you mean body voltage? Body voltage is the amount of electricity passing through your body at any point in time. Okay? One of the things that we pay a lot of attention to is where people sleep. Does anyone here enjoy sleeping? <laughs> I enjoy sleeping a lot. And you sleep really, really well. I sleep um, in a completely electric field magnetic field free environment on a ground sheet, a sheet that grounds me to the earth. It's like camping at home. Okay, and I got six hours last night, and it was so deep, I feel like I got nine. If I get six, I'm great. If I get eight, it's a big bonus. But the sleep quality that I have now is incredible. Dirty electricity. 
How can electricity be dirty? It's just flowing in your walls. Well, we're not talking about the actual dirt. We're talking about dirty harmonics, dirty frequencies, and we'll get into that in more detail. And light vibrational smog, you haven't heard about that. But those fluorescent lights are vibrating light at a frequency that is not normal for humans. What were we designed for? We are designed for sunlight, candles, campfires, kerosene lanterns, you know, light sources that simply glow. That's what we were designed for. Artificial light, including incandescent bulbs, which vibrate at the frequency coming out of the wall, which is 60 cycles per second here, 50 cycles in Europe, that's artificial light. It's actually the least damaging of all the artificial light. And now we've got LED bulbs that are supposed to be so incredible. Well, guess what? Most of them are not. They're, they're just as bad as compact fluorescence. So, electromagnetic radiation is a public health concern without adequate safety standards. What does this mean? Well, you're going to find out. EMR is cumulative. This is the most important thing you need to understand. People will tell you there's nothing wrong with it, it's not dangerous, it's not going to hurt you. What if you're exposed to it for 15, 20, 30 years? I'm sure there's a smoker or two in the room. You don't get lung cancer from smoking five years, probably not from 10 years. But if you keep smoking for 25 years or 40 years, you know what's going to kill you? Smoking. There isn't a smoker, alive or dead, that isn't going to suffer from smoking. And some people say, well, he died in a car accident. Yeah, he was lighting a cigarette. <laughs> so. The telecom industry cartel is the largest industry on the planet right now. Does anyone here know how many cell phones there are on this planet? There are over 4 billion cell phones right now in use on the planet Earth. A scary number. They're bigger than Big Pharma. It is the largest industry and has the most clout, and that's why it is so difficult, the fight that we are involved in. We are in the largest human biological experiment ever. Evidence of harm is increasing worldwide. The scientific studies are in the thousands that say that this is a really, really bad thing. We're having Wi-Fi removed from schools and libraries and hospitals in Russia, Israel, Switzerland, Austria, France, Germany, countries that are actually thinking with their heads and not their wallets. And yes, you are part of a science experiment. And yes, you are a frog in a pot. And the heat is slowly, slowly being turned up, and it might take years for you to boil. But guess what? We're all in the pot together. Those look familiar? I mean, we don't have cell phones that look like that anymore. They don't have the, the little knobby antennas, but it's just a really important concept to get. Smoking is now restricted to smoking areas. Why? Anyone have a problem with me lighting up a cigarette right now? Only one person? <laughs> Who has a problem with me lighting up a cigarette right now? Okay, I would hope so. Because I will pollute your air. Yeah, and I used to smoke like, I don't know, 35 years ago. Not a lot, but it was the cool thing to do. Yeah, a lot of people in here probably used to smoke, and a few probably still do. Okay, and believe it or not, until 1947, the incidence of lung cancer in smokers and non-smokers was the same. You know what happened in 1947? They started to spray the tobacco with herbicides and pesticides and other chemicals and radioactive material. And it is the radioactivity from tobacco and the way it burns that causes the cancer, believe it or not, not the nicotine. When you use your cell phone, some people have the conception that it only communicates between the tower and the cell phone. You think the cell phone actually knows where the tower is? No, it, it blasts out its radiation 360 degrees, right through your head. I want to know something interesting. This is, this is very interesting. 
you probably, most of you probably have one of these if you own a car. What's this? This is a remote, right? Okay. Did you know that you can double the range of your remote? You know how to do that? Hold it against your head. This sounds really freaky. Try it. Walk with your remote. Keep walking away from your car until it won't work. Okay? And then put it here. And you don't even have to aim it through your head at the car. You just put it against your head and click it again, and it will work. And now you can keep walking. Almost double the distance. Because your head and the water in your brain becomes a transmission antenna for this little radio device to transmit that signal almost twice as far as it would normally go. What does that tell you about if you're having problems with your cell phone signal? Just put it against the side of your head and you'll have a better signal. I'm glad you're laughing about this because it's actually not funny. A lot of conflicting conclusions. And the industry will tell you there's nothing wrong with this technology. It will never hurt you. And when I hear that from people, I say, I hope you use your cell phone more. Yeah. I know that sounds like na a nasty thing to say, but no, I don't really do that. But that's what I kind of want to do. Because there are studies that show there's problems and studies that show there isn't. There's a big difference in those studies. The difference is the length of the study. The studies that show there are no problems go for about four years. The studies that show there are problems go for seven, eight, 10, 15 years. The bottom line is really simple. The longer we use this, the more damage it causes to us. And that is the biggest problem. This is the second biggest problem. You got teenagers, are they sleeping with their cell phone and their smartphone underneath their pillow because they don't want to miss a text from their friend in distress at two in the morning? Probably not so much here in Grand Forks, but in Kelowna and Vancouver and the big cities, this is what is happening. And yes, people are getting attached to their phones and yes, everybody's using them and doing this. They don't talk anymore. They don't look in each other's eyes. They text each other. In Kelowna, I see groups of four people sitting around a table in a restaurant and nobody is talking to each other. They are on their freaking devices. And one of the most terrifying things I did was five years ago, I went to Manhattan in New York. And I spent three days in the most horrific electromagnetic pollution on the planet. 14 million people, and they're all on a device. 14 million of them. And they're all on a device. Nobody is talking to anybody. They're all looking at their gadget. It's really quite freaky. I mean, this is, this is what you see all the time. You know, not so much here, I'm sure, but in the big cities. So. Children who own mobile phones by age, 2005 to 2009. So who owns the phones? 10 to 11 year olds, and a lot of six to seven year olds. I was a chaperone at a dance for five to 13 year olds in Vernon in 2007. We had to search backpacks for weapons. Didn't find any weapons, but you know what? I calculated how many kids had cell phones, 85%. Now, they may not own them. Mom and dad might have said, here, put this in your backpack, call us if you have an emergency. But 85% of the kids going to that dance in 2007 had a cell phone. We are on there, yes, we are 14th in smartphone penetration. Only 56% of the population has a smartphone. I don't know what's wrong with us. Come on, Kat. Smartphone users, global youth market by gender. It's the girls. Why are the girls using more smartphones? They talk more, you're exactly right. The girls are the communicators. Guys, who cares, right? Although, in the big cities, I think it's probably about even. And seriously, folks, this is the percentage of people who drive while using a cell phone. Alberta is the winner. 
BC is, where are we on here? I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, we're not far behind. No. We're not far behind. It's a scary thing. This is the epitome of driving with a cell phone. I've seen this. I'm sorry. This is a picture from India, but I've actually seen this, and I've seen them riding bicycles. And have you seen people doing this? Okay. I'm a motorcycle rider, and this, you see a lot more when you ride a motorcycle. Because you're right there, you get up beside them. This is scary stuff. You need to read this book if anything I've said to you has any meaning. This is the book you need to read. I will leave this up for a second. This is Dr. Deborah Davis. She has testified before the Senate in the U.S. This book, you will not be able to put it down. And they have it at the library. And they have it at the library. Thank you, Don. Good. You don't even have to buy it. Okay? It's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. What's the name of the book, please? Disconnect by Devra, D-E-V-R-A, Davis. Thank you. It's called Disconnect. I'm in that process. I am almost completely unplugged. I'll talk about that later. This is the epitome of cell phone use, in my opinion. Look at the area at the back of this guy's head by the antenna. The hair has fallen out. The blood vessels are engorged, and I would suspect if you look at the cell phone, this is probably 10 years ago or so, okay, I would guarantee that he's probably no longer on the planet. Okay, and I'm sure you can figure out how he probably passed away. And this is what you look like if you've had a cell phone tumor. And these pictures are meant to shock you, and I hope they are. because there's a lot of brain tumors happening. You talk to any neurologist and it's running about 13 times what it was 20 years ago. And any neurologist, any neurosurgeon will tell you that we have epidemic going on right now. This is not a joke. We have an epidemic going on right now of brain cancer, which was almost unheard of 30, 40 years ago. What do you mean brain cancer? You know, it's like heart cancer. Has anyone ever heard of heart cancer? The heart never gets cancer. It's a muscle that pumps. Brain cancer? That's, it's, I mean, that, that's, it's crazy. So is there a link? You bet there is. American Academy of Pediatrics. Protect children's health and well-being, please. Reflect the current use patterns, which has not been assessed since 1996. When 44 million people had mobile phones, now it's more than 300 million in the U.S. By the way, that's in the U.S. The American Academy of Pediatrics also says use more meaningful radio frequency exposure metrics. The current metric is the specific absorption rate, which is not an accurate predictor of actual exposure. Has anyone here used a cell phone and felt the side of their head heat up? Yep. Put your hand up if you felt the side of your head heat up. Only a few? I'm surprised. Okay. Because it always heats up. The head heats up when you use a cell phone. And it's measurable scientifically. It always happens. But it's not the heat that causes the problems. It's not the heat that is the danger. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Children's use of cell phones. Um, i got to move closer here. 2000, you, the United Kingdom, independent report recommendations to restrict cell phone use for all children under 16 and no handheld or hands-free phones to be used while driving. Duh. 2001, the German government reviewed science on cell phone dangers and they state parents should keep their children as far away from this technology as possible. 2002, the French government added restriction for pregnant women to use an earpiece only, and for teenagers to keep cell phones away from their developing sex organs. You want to talk about sex organs? How many young men keep their cell phone in their front pocket and keep it on all day long? You know how long? You know how often a cell phone communicates with the cell tower when it's on standby? Depends on the model. My smartphone does it every 13 seconds. It says, hi, Tower, I'm still here. I can take a call. 
and I have measured the blast of radiation that comes off that thing every 13 seconds. That's why I no longer keep a cell phone on at all. I have one, I turn it on twice a day, I check my messages, and I turn it off. And when it's booting up, you know what boot, you know what boot up is? It's doing all its thing to figure out what it's gonna do, and it's kind of thing with the tower, okay? Smartphones now have four antennas, not one like the old cell phones. They have four, because they do all kinds of different things. But as a cell phone, smartphone is booting up, the amount of radiation you get is absolutely huge. And the young men turn it on and put it in their pocket and it boots up right here. How far is that from your boys? That far. The radiation is absolutely massive. And I am predicting, and you can, in 20 years you can say, yeah, I remember that crazy guy. Okay, I am predicting that we will have a whole generation of sterile males. Yeah. In fact, I think we've already got them. There is a whole new science called fertility medicine. Anyone here remember 30, 40 years ago? Did that, was, was there such a thing as fertility medicine? No. People made it and people got pregnant. It was pretty simple. Now you've got to spend $25,000, $30,000 in order to have a child. It's getting pretty crazy out there. <laughs> Children's brains, five-year-old on the left, 10-year-old in the middle, adult on the right, same exact cell phone exposure for the same amount of time, okay? This is just simply representing the amount of absorption and the amount of, this is just the heat created. This has nothing to do with the other effects of the cell phone. And isn't she happy? She's got her own phone. I'm convinced that cell phones cause brain tumors. So now, whenever my phone rings, I let my assistant get it. Yeah, it's sort of funny, but not. Acoustic neuromas. Um, this was one of the first patients that I had. This was 1999. Her name was Melanie. And Melanie uh, developed an acoustic neuroma. It is a tumor on the hearing nerve. And the incidence of these has gone up dramatically because of cell phones. Now, Melanie had to have the tumor removed, and they could not spare her facial nerve, so one side of her face is now permanently paralyzed. You've seen people who have that. Melanie's not happy. She's still alive. Gliomas, this is the brain tumor that is one of the uh, most common in cell phone users. And the risk is going up the longer you use the phone. Okay, all of this is available, by the way. All of this is based in, on sound science. You can, uh, a lot of this I pulled off the internet, but I always check my sources to make sure they're absolutely credible and that the, the things I'm getting are based on sound, really solid, peer-reviewed science. Risk of brain tumor for years since first use. 10 years plus on the right. That's where we go when you have used a cell phone for 10 years. The risk goes up exponentially. Let's talk basics. Man-made electromagnetic fields. Low frequency, EMF. Alternating current is made up of both electric and magnetic fields generated by live electrical wires. You're being exposed to it right now determined by the amount of voltage. Luckily, we run at 120 volts, not 240. Travels a distance of six to eight feet and further. So if you're, sit if you're sitting closer than, than six to eight feet from the wall, you're getting exposed, it can actually be measured, and exist when the devices are not in use. Lamp, lamps, lamps. Oh. I hear a cell phone. Nice ring. Has anyone noticed how many prongs are on the plug of your lamps at home? How many prongs on the plug? Two. In Europe, those lamps have three prongs. They are grounded. Every lamp in your home emits a massive electric field that you are exposed to and is quite measurable and is actually quite nasty for you. Okay? I sleep in a completely non-electrified environment. 
We had, we had switches put in our house to turn off the hydro in the bedroom at night. And anyone who does this phones me up and goes, I can't believe this. I have slept for the first time in decades <laughs> and right through the night. I mean, it's really, really amazing when you do this. You can click off the circuit breaker or whatever. We actually had an electric electrician come in. Yeah, it cost a little bit of money, but we had him put a switch on the wall. We can actually turn off the hydro in our bedroom. And we have little LED lamps that we can turn on the battery operated if we actually need, need a bit of light. Electrical fields are caused, are, are come out of house wiring in your ceilings and floors, power extension cords, power bars, electric blankets, oh my god. Yeah, that's the worst. Water beds, I slept on one of those for about three years. Way, way back before I knew what was going on. Okay, televisions, lamps, clocks, computers, electronic devices, all sorts, high voltage power lines. Hydro workers will not buy a house within a mile of high voltage, high tension power lines. Did you know that? Because they know. Talk to one. They know. They won't do it. Stuff emits out of every single wire, and if you've got dirty electricity, those electric fields are dirty. And they're extreme, much more damaging than they would be if they were clean. AC magnetic fields are produced by the flow of electrical current, travel through equipment and wiring. The more powerful the device, the higher the electric, the magnetic field. The nice thing about these is that they only come out about two to three feet. So if, if you're not close to a device, you're not going to be exposed. Your kitchen appliances all have nasty magnetic fields, but you're only in there to cook a meal, and you're not like sitting on your stove or you know hugging your fridge. So it's not, it's not a big deal, but it can be a challenge. And now we've got all these smart appliances with brains in them. They create a problem. So. High voltage power lines, I have actually walked away from them with my meter. And you have to get between six and 700 feet from high tension power lines before the readings go down to a safe level. And it's about 1,000 feet before they go down to nothing. And if you're one of these sensitive people, as you drive under high tension power lines, you can actually feel it in your body. I taught my kids how to feel that. They hate me for that now. <laughs> no, they don't. Magnetic fields from all kinds of things. I mean, you know, you name the device and it's causing a magnetic field. Your blender, for God's sake, makes a huge magnetic field. Even a Vitamix, which is supposed to be, you know, it's the best. But. Dirty electricity, or harmonic noise imposed on 60, uh, 60 cycle per second lines. We are supposed to have clean 60 cycle per second electricity coming out of our wires and coming into our houses. <coughs> Do you have smart meters, electrical meters here in Grand Forks yet? Yes. yes. They say no. they're not smart, but they do. You've got you've you've got digital meters. Yes. Digital. You've got digital. Okay. Digital meters also create this. They also create this because the power supply. We'll talk about that. It's coming up. It's coming up in the presentation. This harmonic noise is a very, very big problem. Measured at the wall with a meter, I have my meter here that I, I measure this with, uh, influenced by every single electronic gadget. Okay? Is there anyone in this room that remembers uh, living in a home with no electricity? We've got a few old timers here, I love it, I love it, okay. Does anyone here recall how peaceful it is in your house when there's a power failure? You had one last week. Okay. I used to have my patients do this. I would have them go home at night after they were in the <coughs> office. And I would have them put candles around the living room and have the family sit in the living room, turn the, light the candles. And sometimes it wasn't even dark out if it was in the summer. And then go turn the power off to the whole house and sit for an hour and feel what the house felt like without that stuff running in the walls. And then go turn the power back on because I wanted them to have a kinesthetic a body experience of what that was like. Most of them would actually do that, okay? Because I think they, they thought I knew something or something. He's so weird, we gotta do it. I don't know what it was. But they would do this, a lot of them, and they would always come back and they would go, oh my God, that's so incredible. So we're, ex and they would say, you mean we're exposed to this all the time? We live in this stuff. Who goes camping? Not an RV, in a tent. Who sleeps in a tent? That's camping. RVs are not camping. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, because, you know, okay, so 
isn't it great when you're camping in a tent and you're on a sleeping mattress, yeah, or you might be crazy enough to actually sleep on the ground. Who walks barefoot in the grass? Who doesn't like to do that? You don't like walking barefoot in the grass? You need to do it more. You'll get to like it. Really. This stuff travels from your neighbor's house to you. This is the problem with it. And all of those smart meters, whether they're digital or smart, they create dirty electricity. And you get the dirty electricity from all your neighbors. This is the biggest problem. In Kelowna, in West Kelowna, where I live, the smart meters went in in July and August of 2012. They weren't turned on yet for transmitting. People were already getting sick. This is why. All of a sudden, the electricity in their house was making them sick. Compact fluorescent versus an incandescent. Compact fluorescents have a little transformer in them, and they create dirty electricity. Incandescents glow. They also vibrate at the 60 cycle per second, but they don't have a transformer in them. All of these things cause dirty electricity, including the smart meter. I'll let you read that. I'm not going to read it, but all of these things. One of the worst things in your home is your dimmer switches. And most people have them for the dining room lights. Dimmer switches are a horrific source of dirty electricity. But there are all kind of, these are all sources of dirty electricity. I'm going to show you some interesting things now. And Raziel, my lovely assistant, is at the back. And I'm going to ask her to turn on a little device back there. And I'm going to turn the other one up here. measures radio frequency pollution. I call it pollution. You could call it radiation. You could call it energy, whatever you want. I, I use the word pollution because it's no different than cigarette smoke as far as I'm concerned. So is that thing on yet? It's on. Got it? Let me explain. The sound you are hearing is the actual frequency of the device that Raziel turned on at the back, communicating with the one I have at the front. Does anyone know what these are? This is a baby monitor. Okay, let me explain the level of on this. The safety level, according to the real experts in this field, okay, runs at five. It's five microwatts per meter squared, and that's all very technical. But all you need to re remember, okay, is is five. So I'm going to turn this on again. Okay, I'm getting a reading here of ten. I'm quite a ways from that thing. So let's, let's move a little closer. Okay, I'm getting a reading of 200. Five is as high as you should go to be safe, okay? The one Raziel has at the back is the one that's by the baby. How close is it to the baby? Well, you gotta be able to hear the baby. So it's usually about one to three feet away from the baby. 
the, the level is astronomical. So you're nuking the baby. Okay, does anyone know anything about the um, epidemic we have of autism right now? Okay, Do, how, many, how many children are being born with autism and are getting autism in the first two to three years? Does anyone know? It's gone to five out of a hundred. It'll soon be six, seven, eight out of a hundred. It's going up exponentially. Donna. We're, I'm going to do that. That's next. We're going to actually, we're going to actually have the meter on and we're going to unplug those. Because right now they're on, but I just wanted to make one more comment. Okay. Razael, it's still on? Still on. Okay. The comment I'm making is that the, this, is the, this is the parent unit. This is the one that goes in the parent's bedroom. How far is it going to be from the parents? Well, it'll be, you know, on the bedside table perhaps. Or across the room perhaps, okay? This one has a clip on it, so you can clip it to your shirt pocket. I don't know if that scares anybody, but the readings that at, at that distance from it are absolutely off the charts, okay? And I actually didn't find the belt clip <laughs> until about four days ago. I hadn't actually seen it. I've had this thing for many, many months. And it has a belt, a, a clip, so you can clip it on and keep it on your body. Um, we're going to have to hold questions till the end, honestly. If it, is it about this particular particular topic? Super important. Okay, go. I'm just curious what the building biology safe level is. Who sets that guideline? Where that? That's is. the Building Biology Institute in Germany. Okay. okay, and it's based upon extremely sound science. <coughs> building Biology Institute in, uh, in Germany and in the states. Um, and, and, and if you look at the, the practitioners, like Dr. Klinghart, okay, and if you haven't watched any of Dr. Klinghart's videos, get on YouTube, they're all on there. He's one of the world's most renowned medical physicians. I mean, he is highly respected. And, and he also, actually, Klinghart says anything above one microwatt per meter squared is dangerous. And that everybody should be sleeping under a bed canopy because we are all being overexposed. He goes further than the building biology people. We're going to get into talking about levels here uh, as we go along. I just want, to, just want to show you what happens when we unplug these things. Oh, my meter is on again. My meter is having a little bit of a problem. Would you unplug that one, please? to zero point oh, to zero. And because this one, that one isn't functioning, this one isn't functioning either. They have to both be on in order for them to communicate. So. Baby, monitor, baby, baby monitors can be wired. And there was a baby monitor available until about eight years ago that only worked when the baby cried. So it was off, but it had a voice-activated microphone. So when the baby cried, it came on, but we no longer have that technology. I'd love to know why. Okay, what else are we gonna, I've got some more toys here, hang on. You can't buy them anymore. Actually, you can. 
I bought a battery for this one about three weeks ago. Your cordless phone is the worst thing you can have in your house. Please, get rid of the bloody things. Okay? And a lot of people have this thing. This is what causes most of the damage. That's your base. Okay? Most people have it sitting somewhere very convenient, like on their bedside table. Okay? And those people, within three weeks, are sick. They can't sleep. They start developing neurological problems. I've seen countless numbers of these poor people. And they get rid of that thing, and guess what? The next day they're going, oh my god, I'm feeling quite a bit better. And then over a few weeks they get better because they're no longer being fried. But you have to remember that this stuff is cumulative. All of these devices piggyback on the other device. So let's try another one that most of you have in your homes. What's that? It's taking its time. Maybe it has to be hooked up to a computer, but it usually works. <coughs> Did you bring yours? I've got mine here. I mean, it's not fancy like yours, but it works. Ah! It just had to think for a while before it actually came on. This is what Wi Fi sounds like. I'll turn it up 16 beats per second. thinking. It never shuts off. It goes 24-7 unless you shut it off. It's still giving readings of about 20. Five is okay. Okay, so when you have one of these, your whole house is polluted with the signal. When you have one of these, your whole house is polluted all the time. It never shuts off. Wi-Fi in the schools? Is that a good idea? No. Okay. So, in, enough of the play, playing with toys. Uh, this is what I do. I go into people's homes and I find, the fir very first thing I do when I do a home inspection is I find their cordless phone. We turn it off. I find their Wi-Fi router. We turn it off. If they have a baby monitor, we turn it off. I'd love to turn off the smart meter, but we can't. Why do I turn those things off first? I'm really sensitive to this stuff. I've been doing this for a long time and this, thing, this stuff makes me sick real quick. So the very first thing I do within the first 15 minutes is we get all that stuff off. Then we go about finding out everything else. The funny thing is, almost everybody, when we get all this stuff turned off, they look at me and they go, oh my god, I feel different. It's really quite profound. Some of them, <laughs> some of them start crying. That's, that's the real fun part. I love it when they cry. It's, it's tears of joy. Smart meters. The good, the bad, the ugly, and this includes water smart meters, by the way, okay? There is substantial legislation and regulation to protect us from cigarette smoke and other forms of toxic pollution. Perhaps money really does talk. Who's going to protect us from this invisible pollution? Safety code six? Ain't gonna happen yet. Get on the internet, study it up, please. The only mechanism of harm relied upon is the heating thermal effects. It's not the heating and thermal effects that are actually causing the damage to us and our children. Thousands of studies show harm from non-thermal effects. This chart is a little hard to see, but what I want you to notice, okay, is this area here, which are the levels at which we start to develop health challenges. Maybe not right away, but five years, 10 years. It is cumulative, remember I said that? Okay, these are the levels here. Look at the safety levels of Canada in the green here. 
way above the levels at which people start to develop health challenges. Here we have Bulgaria, Hungary, Russia, Switzerland, China, Italy. They're actually thinking a little bit more than we are. And here we have the UK, which is even worse than us, and Australia, and Japan, New Zealand, USA. Our safety standards are significantly out of touch with reality. It is just the way it is. The Western Alliance countries, okay, in Canada, like the four other countries, okay, we, do, we are not protected to protecting the public against the non-thermal effects. The World Health Organization has classified this as possibly carcinogenic to humans. And virtually all of the experts who are presently working on the research in this field are saying the same thing. It should be reclassified to definitely carcinogenic to humans. The precautionary principle, a risk management policy applied in circumstances with a high degree of scientific uncertainty, reflecting the need to take action for a potentially serious risk without awaiting the results of scientific research. The World Health Organization recommended that the precautionary principle could be voluntarily adopted regarding mobile phone radiation and health. Opposing the precautionary principle is almost like opposing motherhood. It is good old-fashioned common sense, and its soundness is embodied in the conventional wisdom of many popular sayings throughout the ages. Has anyone heard these? Better safe than sorry, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's easier to stay out of trouble than to get out of trouble. We're in trouble. This is a smart water meter which hopefully don't come here, but sounds like you've got a fight on your hands. <laughs> and you guys are on the front lines, okay? They work the same in many ways as electrical smart meters, okay? Uh, Don sent me some information on them. Um, I have concentrated mostly on the electrical smart meters, but I am now up to speed on the water smart meters. And they emit every 14 seconds a 7 millisecond radio frequency pulse at 800 milliwatts. In your house, 1 to 3 milliwatts. You're not going to be sleeping by the water meter, I hope. But you never know. It could be in the next room. 6,171 pulses per day. The question I have is, why does the utility company need to have your water information every 14 seconds? Do they want to know if you're watering your lawn too much? Showering too much? I don't get it. I don't know if any, and I mean, there's no explanation for it. It doesn't make any sense to me. However, many years ago, 20,679 physicians said that lucky cigarettes were less irritating. <laughs> However, I don't know if you know this, but more doctors actually smoked camels. <laughs> it's true. I did a survey. I was only four, but I did a survey. <laughs> the Bioinitiative Report. Please, get on the internet. Read this. It's 285 pages long, so don't read the whole thing, just read the summary. You need to read this, bioinitiative.org. Spend some time. Your future depends on it. Your children's future depends on it. Please read this, okay? Double strand, DNA breaks, and oxidative stress. Stress proteins in the cells. Radio frequency induced gene expression changes. Some of this is technical, but it's all nasty, trust me. Sleep cognitive function and performance disorders, blood-brain barrier alterations. Did you know that your brain has a barrier that protects it from nasty stuff that's floating around in your blood? Yeah. That, you know, it can't get into your brain to cause damage? Guess what happens when you use a cell phone? It damages that barrier, and now toxins can get in. Why do you think we have so much brain cancer going on right now? It's because people's brains have got toxins that never, ever used to go in there. 
And God knows we've got enough toxins in our diet and in our, in our you know, environment. If you haven't studied that one, you got to get on the internet. Micronuclei and chromosome aberrations in, in lymphocytes. These are the blood cells, the white blood cells that kill viruses. I would like my lymphocytes to work really well. Because guess what? This winter, I'll probably be exposed to some more viruses. And I want my lymphocytes to kill those suckers. I don't want to spend three and a half, four weeks in bed with the flu. Why don't you just get a vaccine? <laughs> That's another seminar. <laughs> I could give you three hours on vaccination if you want. Okay. I was, I was actually almost run out of Peterborough when I first opened up my practice because I actually had the forms that I gave to mothers in my office so they could go and get them notarized and not have their kids vaccinated. <laughs> because they were told by the schools that they had no choice, and they did, and everybody lied to them except me. Don't get me going on that. <laughs> Neurobehavioral effects. What does that mean? Anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, suicidal tendencies. Did you know that we had two teen teen teenagers commit suicide in Penticton two weeks ago? Two 18-year-olds. Do you think they were texting? You bet they were. Bioinitiative report was updated in 2012. Bioeffects are clearly established to occur with very low exposure levels, non-thermal levels, to electromagnetic fields and radio frequency exposures. Get on the bioinitiative.org and start reading. Smart meters create a wireless grid, accumulates information that can be controlled by the utility. Advanced smart appliances can talk to the utility and relay time-sensitive information. They know when you're washing your clothes. They know when you're using your hair dryer. And they can turn your refrigerator off. That's exactly true. They, use, they, they collect data for utility companies, water, gas, and electric. They use pulsed high frequency, radio frequency. And they have an SMPS switch mode power supply. That creates those dirty electricity harmonics. I am presently saving up my pennies to buy a spectrum analyzer. It's going to run me about 2,000 bucks, but it's going to tell me the dirty electricity frequencies that are running on the lines coming off smart meters. I like to collect toys. The switch mode power supply is a very, very nasty thing, and it is new in the world, and it is nasty. And that's what powers your smart meter and your non-smart digital meter. And uh, I am told that the smart water meter runs on a battery. Runs on a lithium battery. Okay, the good thing about that, okay, there's some good stuff too, is that you're not going to get dirty electricity from the smart water meter. You're only going to get zapped with radio frequency. The electrical smart meter does them both. So what are harmonics? By the way, this is off the uh, BC Hydro website. They've got some really cool stuff on dirty electricity on there, otherwise known as harmonics. It took me about three hours to find it, but it was right on the BC Hydro website. The term harmonics commonly refers to a distortion of the normally smooth utility power. Harmonics are actually higher frequency voltages and currents, and when added to the utility power, produce a distortion of the normal voltage or current waveform. They don't say dirty electricity, they say harmonics. They are the same thing. Usually harmonic distortion must be present continuously to have an adverse effect on the power system. Well, guess what your smart meter, your electric smart meter does? It has a continuous, constant, dirty electricity harmonic pattern that's put on your wires because it doesn't just come on when it transmits. It's on all the time. Causes of harmonics. They say computer equipment, adjustable speed motor drives, which is your, your uh, dimmers, switches, and your ceiling fan drive. Consumer electronics, electronic lighting ballasts, okay? Ballasts for these fluorescents used to be non-electronic, now they're electronic and they cause lots of harmonics. Welders, battery charges, and I put the smart meters on there. They didn't. Just want you to know that. Can't credit BC Hydro with putting the smart meter there. 
Spending a billion dollars will save us money. In West Kelowna, 80% of people have had significant increases in their hydro bills. Uh, we just moved out of a house, um, actually May 1st, we moved out of uh, my sweetheart's house. And um, in August of 2012, I went next door uh, to have a drink with our neighbor, Joe. Uh, and we got talking about the smart meters that had just gone in. He said, you know, I got my first bill. It's twice. My bill has doubled. He said, this is, this is bizarre. He says, I, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, are you, aren't you going to do something? And he said to me, he said, what can I do? It's the hydro company. So he did nothing. Except, you know what he did? He went out and he bought all compact fluorescent light bulbs. <laughs> and then he went out and he spent about $4,000 on smart appliances. And you know what? His hydro bill went down. You know how much? Three bucks a month. <laughs> okay, I think I've made my point. This happens, this is, this is almost consistent. I mean, some of the cases you get on the internet and look at some of the insane increases that people have had. It's, it's, it's absolutely, some of them are just off the charts. Follow the money, Corex and Itron. Why are we paying two to three times more per meter than other places such as Quebec? A billion dollars and counting. The lifespan of smart meters is about half of what BC Hydro's business plan estimates. Did you know that Saskatchewan just decided, yes, applaud that one. They just decided to take out 106,000 smart meters because they've had 12 fires in Regina alone caused by smart meters. Thank you, Saskatchewan. Um, that was a, uh, my understanding is that was the government looked at this and said, these have to come out. I don't think it was court ordered. It was, but it was a government, it was a government um, uh, pr proclamation to the hydro company, get them out, get them replaced back to analogs. BC Hydro said that they were a different brand than what they are. They are a different brand. But I'll show you some an interesting picture I took. It's coming up. Smart meter issues, accountability, and lack of democracy. I personally like think democracy is a really good thing. Are we living in a democracy? It's supposed to be a democracy. Okay. Privacy and data security. I don't like having uh, my privacy abused. And smart meters do that, for sure. Fires, property damage, safety. Health concerns with radiation and dirty electricity harmonics. I took this picture down West Side Road, just south of Vernon, last fall. Does anyone think maybe the smart meter caused this fire? I think so. The house was completely destroyed, by the way. They, had, they were going to try and rebuild it, but then they decided no. It was, they were going to you know, tear it down and build her a new one. This poor lady uh, was, I don't know, she was living across the lake in, in, in Lake Country at the time and had been out of her house for quite a long time. 160 times the cell phone, uh, the level of cell phone radiation produced by smart meters. They are hugely, hugely polluting. And I have one on the side of my house. We moved into a place with a smart meter. Why? Why? because it was there, and actually it's a really good thing, because you know what, this is what I do. And so now I am faced with completely cleaning up that situation for myself so that I can do it for other people. The real issue for some individuals, the primary issue relates to privacy. But for others, it is their right to live in a healthy environment that is being violated, and that is the biggest problem for me. I have no control. When BC Hydro says you're getting a smart meter, it's just part of the deal. You can, you can put up a sign that says no trespassing, but yep. you cannot take out that meter. And they will do it anyway. Uh, yep. They haven't done it to me. I got a bar across the Yeah, good for you. So it's, well, the, the house that we just sold, the house that we just sold has a very, very interesting uh, barrier to the smart meter that was made by a very good friend of mine who lives in Vernon. He's a world-class, world-famous metal artist. 
and he made this thing for me. And it is bolted to the side of that house. And the people that bought the house are thrilled because <laughs> they'll never have to get one. Big Brother really is watching. Okay, this is getting into a little bit conspiracy theorist stuff. Hope you don't mind if I go there a little bit. Governments may determine, for example, that it is too risky to have citizens off the grid, detached from technological ecosystem. To be sure, in the future, as now, there will be people who resist adopting and using technology. People who want nothing to do with virtual profiles, online data systems, and smartphones. Yet a government might suspect that people who opt out completely have something to hide, and thus are more likely to break laws. And as a counterterrorism measure, that government will build a kind of hidden people registry. You might also be subjected to a strict set of new regulations that includes rigorous airport screening or even travel restrictions. If you think I'm a conspiracy theorist, okay, I didn't write this. This is written by people who actually, you know, they're not crazy like me, okay? No hidden people allowed. Guess what? You've just tossed a jar of peanut butter in the grocery cart. When your smartphone buzzes, you glance down at the screen, you see a message that seems downright clairvoyant. Buy some jelly, get a dollar off. This is happening right now. This technology is presently being used. Convenient, convenient, Certainly, creepy, maybe, this is one vision for indoor positioning, a fast evolving technology that is allowing retailers, anyway, we don't have to go on with this. This is happening right now. You walk into a store, your cell phone is on, they know you're there, they know what you bought, they've got all your information, and they start trying to, has anyone had this happen on the internet? Yes. Where all of a sudden you get things popping up, and it's like, it's, it's like they know who you are, or what you buy, or what you're thinking. It's, it's scary stuff. Google is really scary. Google is quite terrifying. This is a very interesting picture. You can't see a lot of this, but this is a list of all of the health challenges that, that were considered to be occurring. In 1972, this is declassified from US Naval Medical Research on nuclear radiation. But if you look at this list, it's really interesting. Okay, because these are exactly the same problems that people are encountering with radio frequency radiation, coupled with all the other stuff that I talked about today as well. This is out of my brochure at the back, okay? This is the list of exposure effects. It's only a partial list of the actual, I have, I have a much more detailed list than this, but it would take us like an hour to go through it, it's pretty scary. But if you look on here, you'll see a number of things that you might have, your neighbors might have, your family might have going on. Okay? And many of these things are going up in their incidence exponentially. What does that mean? That as we increase the number of cell phones and the number of cell phone towers, we see the levels of these diseases going up at exactly the same rate. Lou Gehrig's disease, otherwise known as ALS, okay? 20 years ago, nobody had a clue what that was. Has anyone in here heard of it? Most people have heard of it now. Why? We've got, we've got runs and things to raise funds to help, right? It's, a, it's a, a horrific, horrific neurological disease. I actually lost a friend to this in high school. <clears throat> the, guy was, the guy's name was Don Romanoli. He was the most talented guitar player, singer you had ever imagined. He got this at the age of 17 and he lasted seven months. It was horrific. All of these things are things that people are experiencing. And all of these things are things that either improve or go away when they get their electromagnetic environment cleaned up and start to shield themselves and protect themselves from this. Indeed, these symptoms are very consistent with the experience of electrosensitive people. Anyone in here electrosensitive? OK. What does electrosensitive mean? It means you're sensitive to electromagnetic pollution, more so than other people. How did I find out I was electrosensitive? I'm going to tell you a quick little story. My father passed away in 2010. He was 93 and a half. I'm the only one that wears hearing aids, and I forgot them this morning, so you have to yell at me. Um, I'm the only one that wears hearing aids, so I got his hearing aids. Well, they sat in the, 
in, in my dresser drawer for a year, and then I took him into the hearing aid guy, and I said, would you program these for me? And he did all that stuff to get them to work for my hearing thing, and I put them on, and I, you know, they sounded great. Went out to my car, drove home, 10 minute drive, got home, had a headache. I thought, this is weird, I haven't had a headache in like decades. I took the hearing aids off, half an hour later my headache was gone. Next day I put the hearing aids on, 10 minutes later I had a headache. Uh, yeah, don't spoil my punchline. <laughs> so, next day I took him into the hearing aid guy and I said, so what's different about these with my, than my other ones? What's the difference? He said, I don't know. I, he said, they've got Bluetooth. And I said, what do you mean they've got Bluetooth? Bluetooth is a radio frequency thing. He said, didn't you notice that when you turn the volume up on this one, the volume goes up over here? And I said, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. He said, they've got Bluetooth. And I said to him, you mean they talk to each other through my head? <laughs> and he said, yes, isn't that great? And I said, can you turn it off? And he said, yeah. I said, would you do that? He hooked them up to his computer and he turned it off. I put them on, no headache. Okay, so hang on, hang on. You haven't, you haven't connected the dots on this yet. Or maybe some of you already have. How many millions of people are out there wearing these hearing aids and are completely screwed up because they don't know that the hearing aids are giving them a brain tumor, affecting their personality. And re the reason I say this is that when I first told this story in Kelowna, there was a woman in the audience. She uh, is a retiring, almost retired now, audiologist. And she put up her hand, she said, I gotta tell you a little story. She said, last week I had a guy come in with his wife and, and they came in and his, and his wife said, I don't know what you did to my husband, but, but he is horrible. He is mean, nasty, ugly, and he's never been like this. And it's since he got those blanking hearing aids. And she said, I turned off the Bluetooth and he put them back on. And his wife phoned the next day and she said, I've got my husband back. So, figure out the impact that that has on our society just from the millions of pairs of Bluetooth hearing aids that are out there. I mean, this is scary stuff I'm telling you, but it's real. If one removes oneself from the sources of EMF exposure, these difficulties can greatly improve or disappear entirely if addressed early, but the long-term effects from significant exposure, even if one has completely insulated oneself from RF exposures of all kinds going forward, including cell phones, are still unknown. Yes, we are part of a big experiment. All public health officials should be alert to the indications for an EMF Alzheimer's connection and take steps to integrate this critical knowledge into public health and prevention planning. Yes, there is Wi-Fi in all of the old age homes. I've checked it out. Most of them don't use cell phones, thank God. This would include lowering EF, EMF exposure guidelines to levels that do not have the predictable effects on brain imaging and blood work described. Okay, this is the incidence of Alzheimer's. We're soon going to have an epidemic and an impact on our healthcare system that will be absolutely devastating. My mother was 14 years with her Alzheimer's before she finally got out. It wasn't fun. By the way, I do everything I can to prevent that because 50% of women who have Alzheimer's, 50% of their kids get Alzheimer's. And she's only got three. <laughs> and every single one of her siblings, by the way, had Alzheimer's except her sister Rose who passed away from liver cancer uh, before she got it. So. One cannot help but wonder what impact modern technologies have had on the in incidence of Alzheimer's, or how long and also what the incidence of Alzheimer's has been in indigenous cultures who have lived without any of this. It used to be called senility. And people used to die of old age. Remember that? Does anyone remember that, when people used to die of old age? Almost unheard of now, isn't it? Yeah. Scientific evidence shows adverse health effects. All studies show increased brain tumor after 10 years. Malignant brain tumors, 40% increase 
with 30 minutes per day after 10 years. Heavy cell phone use by teen, teens shows four to five times more brain tumors by their late 20s. These are all verified scientific studies. If you haven't seen this guy, Dr. Ole Johansson, get on the internet and check him out. He's a Swedish scientist. He is quite incredible. You, you, you've got to you got to study this guy. His work is absolutely top-notch, and he's doing more than, than any other scientist. Yeah, sure, no problem. Dr. Oli Johansson. You got it. Barry Trower, if you haven't seen Barry Trower, he's got lots of phenomenal YouTubes, okay? And he says, as does Ole Johansson, that we are going to see the effects of this 150 years from now, and we will look back and we will say, oh my God, what did we do? And what he's saying is that it is quite likely that we will have a very large percentage of our population that cannot conceive a child. Mind you, they want to bring the population down to 500 million anyway, so what the heck, right? I'm being facetious, of course. Get unplugged. What does that mean? Okay. I am almost completely unplugged now. I have come up with some interesting new terms. I want you to get an uncordless phone. I want you to get unwireless internet. And I want you to get an unwireless baby monitor, for God's sake, if you have to use one. Or go back to the old ways, you know, put the kid in your room. Yes. That's a pretty good baby monitor. How about an unwireless security camera? That would work. Unwireless computer games. A dog, I love it. <laughs> and an unwireless slash dumb TV. I don't know how many people here have a smart one, but in Kelowna, lots of people have smart TVs. And oh, there's another one I've got to add to this list. Get an unwireless speaker system. Now they've got wireless speaker systems. I have measured the, the radio frequency pollution coming off those things, and it's huge. Wireless subwoofers. How would you like that subwoofer frequency vibrating through your body, through the, the frequency waves? That's a scary thought. Safe sleep is sacred. Sleep time is when we heal and regenerate. If there's anyone in here who does not think sleep is sacred, okay, put up your hand. Thank you. You're okay. Protect your sleeping area from all forms of EMF and RF. This is really, really important. And especially, especially for children. Okay? Sleep is when we regenerate. People that don't sleep well get sick. They always get sick. Donna. Um, I went to the Waterbeater Open House, and one of the Neptune reps told me that he would have his child sleeping next to one. Wow. Oh, he's in trouble. <laughs> wow. Unplug from the grid if you possibly can. I'm hoping to go solar. It's not right away, but I would love to unplug from the grid completely. These are bed canopies. Dr. Klinghardt says everybody should be sleeping under one of these if there's a cell tower within like five miles. They're silver fiber netting. They aren't cheap, but you only have to buy it once. I, I, these are one of the products that we have, that we use for fueling people who are in serious situations. And in Kelowna, I consider downtown Kelowna to be uninhabitable for human beings. I have spent a whole day measuring the cell towers in Kelowna and measuring the radio frequency pollution in downtown Kelowna, and it is unfit for humans to live in. The whole downtown core, and many parts of the outlying areas as well. So get rid of your sleeping pills. You won't need them anymore. It will shock and amaze you when you get your first night's sleep with no electricity and no RF pollution. So. That is the end of my presentation. I'm going to have Kevin Proto come up now because we do have some information on solutions. I don't know how many of these apply to what Don is concerned about in the smart water meters. However, there, is, there are significant similarities between the two. Many of the issues are completely parallel. 
Is that correct, Tom? Tom? Is that correct? The, the, the issues are, are, are quite parallel. So Kevin is going to talk a little bit about what he's doing and some of the strategies that are available for helping you either to not get one or if you've got one, like we do in West Kelowna, to get rid of them. Yes, Donna. Um, autism is now predictable. If you're an alternative, this is your uh, advance. That one there. Autism, autism is predictable. Women during pregnancy, if they are exposed to large amounts of radio frequency pollution from cell phones, from Wi-Fi sitting in the next room, from cordless phones on the bedside table, or across the room, or as you saw, it doesn't have to be, it can be down in the kitchen. It can be in the room below. Uh, all of these things exposing a woman uh, to these things as the baby is developing inside her lead to autism. It is now predictable by measuring the amount of radio frequency exposure she has during the pregnancy. It is now uh, possible to predict the likelihood of having an autistic child, either from the get-go or perhaps coming later on after it's been exposed additionally to a baby monitor or to a Wi-Fi or a cordless phone or whatever is in the room next door to the, to the poor baby. Okay? Um, one of the worst cases I saw of, of this sort of thing, I'll just quickly relate this to you, was this poor woman in Lake Country um, who ha has a husband who has had uh, lymphoma, uh, which is cancer of the brain. He had lymphoma in the brain, the poor man. And he's still alive, but he's, he, he's, in, he's in extremely rough shape. And I went in to do an inspection of the home. And he had set the place up with all kinds of electrical gadgets. And he had put in a Wi-Fi range extender. Does anyone know what that is? It's a range extender. It makes your Wi-Fi much more powerful so that you can walk down the block and use it out in the yard and whatever else. Okay. So the Wi-Fi range extender, extender was beside the Wi-Fi router, which was beside the the wireless TV gadget, and these things were all two and a half feet from her head because her bed was on the other side of the wall, and her head was on the, on the wall facing these things, which were two and a half feet from her. And the woman was, was beside herself. She was so sick and so incredibly <clears throat> out of her mind okay, with, with what was happening to her, because they had just moved from Edmonton. Okay, and here she's dealing with a husband who's on long-term disability because he's trying to recover from brain cancer. And she's going through this, and this woman's a nurse. She knows, like, you know, she kind of knows what's going on. So they bring me in. The very first thing I do in my little trip is I go and I find all these things, and we unplug them all. And <clears throat> she's one of the ones that broke into tears. because She looks at me, and she said, oh, my God. She said, I feel normal for the first time in months. And that's all it took. Okay, we also measured the body voltage coming out of all the gadgets. The clock radio, two clock radios, one on each side in the bedroom and all of those things. And, and then we had her laying on the bed, looking at the meter, measuring the amount of electricity passing through her body. Okay, and then you know what I did? I tripped the breaker. It's like a little gadget that you plug into the wall and you push a button and it trips the breaker on the panel. So we shut off all the hydro in the bedroom as she watched the meter and the meter went to zero. <laughs> and she said, oh my god, I can't believe it. She said, I thought I felt so much better after getting the, all the gadgets off. She said, but now I finally feel like I'm perfectly normal. So these are the things that happen. I mean, and these things are very profound. So I cannot urge you enough to get, you know, get these things turned off. But get an evaluation done if you want to understand all of these things, because you can do some of these yourself, but some of them actually need to be evaluated, okay, and measured with proper equipment. I'm not trying to be snarky, but I noticed you use a lot of the laptop. Yeah. Is that because you're not using it? The laptop I'm using has the Wi-Fi turned off. I never, ever put that on my lap, ever. Okay, I put it on a desk if I ever use it, and the only time I use a, a, a laptop computer is at a presentation like this. That's the only reason I have it. Uh, thank you for the question. I'm going to turn things over to Kevin. He's going to talk about solutions 
and then we'll do questions and answers um, over uh, for a little while, actually, right? Okay, thank you uh, very much. That was a great presentation. Um, maybe we could just get the lights for a second here, um, if you don't mind. Um, okay, so how many people here are pretty annoyed, pissed off, are not happy with what you just heard? If you could just give me a show of hands, please, that would be great. Okay, so that, that, that was the same thing as myself uh, probably about uh, eight years ago I, when I saw my first uh, seminar. That was with Sean Buckley, and he was talking about Bill C-6, uh, which uh, started off as Bill C-51, went to C-52, went to Bill C-6, then went to Bill C-36, thank you. And that was a consumer product safety uh, bill, which gave the impression that it was all about uh, consumer safety, of course. But what it, what, what it truly was, was the uh, removal of uh, common law, search and seizure of property, where they get to withhold it. And once you dug into that, it was just truly alarming. And I'm like, holy crap. And I went home and I was just like, I was all pissed off. And, and the one thing I, it, it got me starting to look into things. And so um, I started watching more videos. I would research. I would contact the people that actually uh, put together these uh either the YouTube videos or the seminars, like I, I would go, I would go out of my way to find Ross, people like him, and I'm like, I want to talk to you. And um, the one thing I realized at the end of the day is through these seminars, you get a lot of information, but what lands up doing, what lands up happening is people end up leaving and they're walking out and they're just like, wow, that was really scary, hey, honey, gentle, what are we going to do? And that's what, and that's where I came up with uh, my uh, idea or my contribution towards a solution to the problems that we have, is I started local supporting locals. And uh, one of the things that provoked me, I, and I, I have to tell the story very quickly here, is because um, at the, our Peace City Festival, we just had Trooper play. And Trooper goes back to the late 70s and 80s, and uh, that's when my, my 80s is when I had my teenage years. And one of my favorite songs was Raise a Little Help. And uh, what it says in the song, if you don't like what you see, rearrange it. If you're all, how does it go? How did, if you're all screwed up, rearrange it. Or if it's all screwed up, rearrange it. So I actually videotaped the whole song, and then I actually got him to sign my calendar, because I told him the story. I said, when I need inspiration to be the activist that I am today, I said, I listen to that song, and it reminds me of what I'm doing and why I do what I do. So local supporting locals is not a new concept. I did come up with the name itself, but it's not a new concept. We've just forgotten, and we are too disconnected in our communities here, and that's how they are able to bully us the way they do. As, as Ross was very well put it, uh, pointing out here, um, we're too busy in our virtual worlds. Everybody's texting. And Facebook, everybody does all their bitching, all their pro, uh, activism, well, in the activist world, we call them clicktivists. They click like, they click share, and they think they did something. Oh yeah, and then they signed the petition. Mm -hmm. And right now, we're in the perfect, we're right in the perfect times. We do have local elections happening. You need to get out in your community, find people that you think should be running for council, like, we were, like we're doing in uh, Penticton here. And so local supporting locals will be promoting certain candidates because we know where their integrity is. But uh, so ju just to tell you a little bit about our calendars here, um, because they're very unique. Because what, what we want you to do, this is the Okanagan chapter that we're forming. So this is this is the second annual uh, Okan South Okanagan calendar, and we're we're so we've also initiated the first for uh, Kelowna, and then our goal is to get the North Okanagan. So um, with with myself and uh, the people that I've worked with uh, since I started this four years ago. Our goal is to form the Okanagan chapter, but then we want people to start chapters where they are, where we keep in constant communication. Okay, so the problem I've had is people love my concept so much that they think that they can do it themselves and they call it something else and then they go and they get their, they get their egos get in the way. Please don't do that. We gotta work together, people. It's gotta be a we. Local supporting locals is not about me and it's not about you. It's about all of us here. So um, I gotta just put this, uh, here for a second. So the way these calendars work, they're, they're very unique because it's a 13-month calendar which is normally 26 pages. These actually have 40. 
So it tells you who we are, what we do, why we do it, why it's very important to shop locally. The number one solution to the problems, even with the elections, when they talk about jobs, city government does not create jobs. It's people that come here that bring the jobs. So we have to create the environment for them to actually want to come here. But the number one solution is keep your money local. Yes, it is a little bit more expensive, but even if you, depending on your uh, budget, 10% of your money once a week, give it to your local businesses. It will make a big difference. Um, it shows you how to find us on Facebook and YouTube. And now Local Supporting Locals has an internet radio show. It's live every Wednesday on awakeradio.us, which is simulcast around the world. I call it the heartbeat of the Okanagan. I talk about issues that affect us that affect us here, but also globally, and what we're trying to do to solve those problems here. So, and as well, we talk about issues such as what are genetically modified organisms, what you should be looking out for when you go shopping. Dr. Shiv Chopra, who I consider to be a friend of mine now, because I did meet him when he came through here with Dr. Theory of Rain. He worked for Health Canada for 35 years, had scientists discovered the bovine of growth hormone, what was causing mad cow, uh, the RBGH, and instead of getting a medal, he was fired. Okay, so, yeah, so it's very, very informative, and we, we even make sure we put a disclaimer, this doesn't necessarily reflect the views of local supporting locals or its sponsors. If you've got a problem, call Dr. Shoka, don't call me. Um, Alex Adamenko, our Southern Interior MP. Um, which I have to say, he actually made a donation to local supporting locals and uh, the only man in politics I would ever in uh, endorse, but I do not support party politics in any way, shape or form, so I don't support any party. I believe strongly that all the change comes from local government. So, um, But he wrote about how the Canadian Food Inspection Agency was supposed to look after our safety, kind of like, you know. Um, change the term local so that this way big box stores can lie to you now and tell you they're bringing in local produce, but they're not. So very, very informative. Bill Vanderzam actually wrote about uh, uh, the geoengineering, or some people call it chemtrails. He actually, through the Freedom of Information, uh, requested the contents of the chemicals that are in those aerosols. Really? Yes, yes. So I, com I, I seriously commend him. I know he's got a past from before where some people are controversial with Bill, but I was right there with him with the fight the HST, and I was there with, uh, with, with him on this here. And, so, and then we got our shop local cutout directory here, and it's, uh, the Farm Fresh symbol tells you which restaurants and cafes actually do bring in real farm produce for those who care, and you should. You spend $2,000 on this to protect all the, from viruses and everything else like that, and then you go and buy 50 cent itchy band soup and you wonder why things aren't working properly here. You know, processed foods are just horrible. <laughs> um, so, yeah, without the sponsors, the calendars don't get printed. So, the concept when I came up with it, Because I didn't have a thousand dollars is what they wanted for the fruit, like to create the maca. So I had to put it together myself, and I put it together with staple and tape. Yeah, I know, eh? And I showed you, I cut it out of the newspapers just to show you what it was going to potentially look like. Provided I got the sponsors, of course. And how the pricing worked and everything else like that. And I lined it up with 64 sponsors for the first calendar. I went business to business going from Summerland to Asoyas to put these together, and I don't drive. I did it all through walking, biking, and a really good thumb. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, I went with the dark greens because I, uh, I don't subscribe to a lot of the greenwashing that's been taking place now with carbon credits, carbon tax, it's, uh, it's yeah. Um, yes. And then we came up with the, uh, with the second uh, calendar here. So then once we get past all that stuff, then we get to the good stuff, uh, as I like to say. These are our farmers. Who they are, what they grow, how to find them all again. And um, like I like to point out to people, you see this right here? That's your pharmacy. F-A-R-N-A-C-Y. That's your pharmacist, or at least for most of them. I can't say this about all farmers, but again, I didn't know one person when I moved to uh, Penticton when I started this. And I can't begin to tell you the massive network that I have now, but I went to their farms and I got to know what they grow, who they are, and so now I know what I'm eating at the end of my day. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so what we're trying to do here is, these are, did you know food facts? Okay, kidney beans. Look like kidneys. So if you're having problems with your kidneys, guess what? Hey, there you go, eat kidney beans, right? Um, so, food is your medicine, and believe me, okay, Health Canada is on its path to demonize 
food um, as medicine. Okay, so like I just got into studying last week uh, into chaga because I found out the incredible medicinal qualities to it. But if you if you go and lay those claims onto a website, put it onto a piece of paper, and God forbid if you go into a store, farmers markets are in there are okay. But um, Health Canada will come after you because you can't lay claims. Pharmaceutical pills can do whatever they want. And uh, another thing we did here is we included the uh, festivals events, all the farmers markets that go on throughout our South Okanagan, and then we included money saving coupons on the back here so that we created the win-win situation for everybody involved, whether it be for the sponsor, for the people that purchase the calendars, um, and the people that make the calendars here. So we found a way to fund, help you fund your organization here. So again, don't take this concept and go recreate it. Join us and to, to grow local, supporting locals here. Sorry? Well, I sent you a message today. How do we start a chapter? Well, you give me a shout. I mean, we can't get into it right now. Like, no, yeah. Yes, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't, I can't begin to tell you. Like, uh, the, definitely. Yeah, we can communicate today. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely give me a call here. And uh, just one more plug here i got to give uh, is to the Agora newspaper. Um, I, don't, it, I don't think they come out this far here, but I know they are in Penticton. Uh, it's one of the most in uh, informative magazines on uh, the market today, and um, it, it's kind of funny the guy that's uh, running for a council in Pitt and actually helped to uh, initiate this uh, magazine initially. He's 30 years old, he's an organic cherry farmer, uh, father of a one-year-old, and he's got another one on the way. He's a herbologist and teaches food forestry, and he's running for Penticton Council. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you. So just so you know, like, uh, like we're going to be in touch with Donald here, and Donald's going to be very persistent with this issue here and keep us up to date. And so we want to work together with organizations, even if you're not in Penticton or in the South or in the Okanagan, we want to work with you and try to keep the information flowing here. So if they lose you, call me. I'll send you back to him. Thank you very much, Donald. Thank you very much, Kevin. Right here. Um, okay, I apologize. Actually, unless you want to follow through with this, Ross, or... No? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so just uh, in saying that now, so in protecting yourself uh, from these smart meters, uh, one of the things you need to do is you need to get a no trespassing sign, like this gentleman was saying right here. Uh, we do have copies. Uh, Rosie Allen in the corner here has copies of the no trespassing. They need to be worded correctly. Okay, so um, there's actually uh, sovereign, free men, whatever you want to call them. I'm so reluctant to want to use any of these words because apparently they're homeland terrorists now because they know law. Um, but it's coming out of a lot of it comes out of Black's Law. But these are put together by very, very knowledgeable people. So they cannot step foot on your property, and he has sued um, Revenue Canada for coming onto his property.